Okay, we are continuing our study of Matthew chapter 2 now, and we're going to finish it off. The, um, let's turn in your Bibles now. We've, we've looked at Matthew chapter 1, obviously, and saw the wonderful stuff there. And chapter 2, we heard about the trip to Egypt and then the return from Egypt. And so that's what we're looking at now. It says in Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, verse 19. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he said, I just set up my business. We just got here. I got to move again? Notice Joseph doesn't hesitate in these stories. Wherever he has, he hears the word of God. He hears the, the angel speak and he acts immediately. This is all revealing or showing to us that he is Joseph the righteous, right? Joseph the righteous. He was a righteous man. And remember, as we talked about before, to be righteous, dikaios, uh, the righteous one in Matthew's gospel, that means someone who keeps the law. Righteousness is keeping the Torah perfectly. And so Joseph here is shown to be one who keeps the law perfectly. Okay, so he goes now, he brings it, the new Israel out of Egypt. He brought him into Egypt, and now he's going to bring him out of Egypt. Verse 21, he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus reigned over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. So Archelaus... Um, I have a little note here I want to read for you on him. Archelaus was one of the sons of Herod the Great, obviously. When Herod the Great died, the Roman Emperor Augustus divided his territory into three regions to be governed by his three sons. Archelaus governed Idumea, that's Edom, in the region of Edom, and Judea, which you know where that is, and Samaria, and obviously not Galilee. Augustus eventually exiled him to Gaul for his ruthless and cruel governance around AD 6, and his territory was thereafter ruled by a series of Roman procurators, the most famous being Pontius Pilate, who ruled from 26 to 36, AD 26 to 36. Okay, so uh, Archelaus is as crazy as his father, so Rather than go back there and deal with, you know, Herod the Great, number two, uh, an angel warns him in a dream not to go. He was afraid to go there and being warned in a dream. He withdrew to the district of Galilee. Now, Galilee, where is this? This is, if you think of the promised land, uh, you've got, you can think of the, the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, if you look at the Dead Sea and to the west, to the Mediterranean, that's Judea. That's the region of Judea. North of there, north of Judea, from the Dead Sea, and this is on the, we're talking about the west side of the Jordan, uh, north of there is the region called Samaria. That's that region that was uh, also called the Northern Kingdom of Israel. Remember, in the um, in the after Solomon died, his son Rehoboam took over, and the kingdom of Israel that had been he had inherited from Solomon divided into two groups: the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom is was called Judea because that was the primary tribe there, and the northern kingdom was called Israel or also Samaria because they had a capital city called the capital, it was the Hill of Shemer, and it became known as Samaria. 
a lot more has gone on since that time to the present, uh, the present time in the first century here to that northern kingdom and also in the south. But so you have uh, Samaria. But then when you go north of Samaria, you come to the region of Galilee, right? And this is uh, if you think of the uh, the Sea of Galilee, and you can see the Jordan River and most you know maps and things going down to the Dead Sea. So Galilee, and here we're talking about the Galilee on the west and north side. The west and north side of Galilee, also southern. Um, if you think of uh, uh, you know a clock, Jesus is going to be spending most of his time. If, you know, if the Sea of Galilee was a clock, he's going to be spending most of his time from right around one to twelve o'clock, all the way down to what would be nine o'clock. Okay, that whole area right there is we're going to see him doing a lot of work. And sporadically, we'll see him down at you know down at seven o'clock and six o'clock and things like that. But for the most part, he's going to be hovering in that that northwest part of Galilee, Capernaum, and that region. Okay, uh, and then on the other side of the Sea of Galilee was called the Galilee of the Gentiles. This was all Gentile land. The the Decapolis, the the ten pagan Gentile cities, were over there. Remember when Jesus goes over there? That he encounters the the man who's possessed by demons. That's where the swine go into the into the water. That's all Gentile land at this point in history over on that east side of Galilee. Okay, uh, so now uh, it says he withdrew into the district of Galilee, and he went and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that what was spoken of by the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. So Galilee was ruled by the younger brother of Archelaus. Uh, this is Herod Antipas, who ruled that region until 39. This is the Herod that we'll hear about giving trouble to John the Baptist and later on in Jesus as well. Herod Antipas. Okay, he was, in his, he was not quite as crazy as his older brother Archelaus. So verse 23, look what it says there. He went and dwelt in Gal in a city called Nazareth, that what was spoken of by the prophets may be fulfilled. Quote, at least in my Bible here, quote, he shall be called a Nazarene. End quote. Does anyone have anything different? There do you have quotes in a different spot? In the Bible I have in front of me here, this RSV, it says, quote, he shall be called a Nazarene, end quote. Do you have anything different? Same thing? Do you have quotes in yours? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it in the same spot? Mm-hmm. There. Yeah. Okay. So, when you look at this, you say, well, it says, he shall be called a Nazarene. So this is a quotation from the prophets. You've got quotation marks. But if you go into the Old Testament, there's no... A sentence like this anywhere in the Old Testament. You look in the prophets, there's no he shall be called a Nazarene anywhere in the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. It's not there. So in most of your Bibles will give you some uh, an index to Isaiah. We'll talk about that in a second. But but there is nowhere in the anywhere in the prophetic literature even if it said in the prophets here he's got multiple prophets but there's no such quote. What's going on? And this has led uh, occasionally to people getting confused and oh, it's maybe Matthew's just trying to pull the wool over eyes. So, no, obviously that's not what's going on. So uh, the thing that should tip you off already is the fact that he says prophets. Do you see the word prophets plural there? So that should tip you off that you're you're dealing with something different from what you've seen before. Look earlier in Matthew's gospel when he quotes. Look at Matthew chapter one. Verse 23, up to verse 22, in fact. This is Matthew chapter 1, verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Singular. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Everyone knows that's Isaiah. Even today, you know, someone who doesn't know their Bible too well is going to often know that, oh yeah, that's a quote from, I think, Isaiah or something like that. Uh, so most people are familiar with that. It's so obvious. This is Isaiah is such an important prophet that he just he just simply says by the prophet. 
right? So everyone knows. But notice it's singular there, and it's very precise. And if you look at those quotes and you go back to the Old Testament, Isaiah seven fourteen, that's exactly what it says, right there. Okay. So now, the next time we get a quote like that to fulfill the prophets, look at what it says in chapter two. In chapter 2, verse 5, this is when Herod is trying to investigate where the Christ is to be born. Chapter 2, verse 5, they told him, quote, in Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, this is what the whole thing is, their own quote, but by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, the land of Judea and Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will govern my people Israel, Micah. You go back to Micah, that's exactly what Micah says, right? So now let's look at another one. It says uh, for the, um, the prophecy from Hosea, or Hosea, this is chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 15, and he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, have I called my son. Look at the quotes. You go back to Hosea, or Hoshea, that's exactly what it says there. And then look at this next one. This is in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 17. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. He even gives you the name. And then, quote, a voice was heard in Ramah, wailing loud lamentation, Rachel referred children. She refused to be consoled because they were no more. If you go back to Jeremiah, there it is. But now you come to this verse. Look at this. Look at chapter 2, the last line here in chapter 2, verse 23. And he went and dwelt in the city called Nazareth, so this is flowing along like what we've seen before. That what was spoken of by the prophets, plural. Oh, well, something's different. He shall be called a Nazarene. Quote, quote, right? So what's right off the bat, something's tipping you off, there's something different. He's using the plural there. He's not quoting from one prophet, he's quoting from multiple prophets. But you might say, well, that doesn't that exacerbate the problem? Right? Not only does this text not appear in one of the prophets, but he's claiming multiple prophets for this one, and it's not there. This is why I became a Buddhist last week. I was reading this. I said, hey. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay, so what's going on here? Prophets. Matthew's not quoting from a prophet. He's quoting from prophets. So we're, now we're looking for something that we can find in many of the prophets, not just one. So that's our first clue to where to find this. The other clue, and this is the problem with translation, the other clue is to adjust our quotation marks. This will help us. The other clue you find looking in the Greek text, there's other clues as well. But the... Um, in fact, before we get to the Greek text, let's get some other... Some other uh, no, let's do the Greek text now and we'll look at the others. So, the word... Um, when we see these quotation marks in our Bible, quote, he shall be called a Nazarene, end quote. We look back in the Greek text and this is not what we find. Because in the Greek text, there are no quotation marks. There are no quotation marks in Greek at all. They don't exist. It's a, that's a, a function of modern script. Quotation marks. Punctuation. A lot of punctuation is just a modern thing. So, when you go back and look at the Greek text here, what you get is a particle, which you can write in English, O-T-I. O-T-I. O-T. O-T. Now, this particle in Greek has a very wide range of use. Sometimes it is used to indicate to the reader that what immediately follows is a quotation, a direct quotation. However, that's a relatively rare use of it. Oti is like in every other sentence of Greek in, the, in, the, in Matthew's Gospel here. You're reading, you see it all over the place. It can mean because... 
It can be, it can be a relativizer for an indirect quote. Uh, that, things like that, not demonstrative that. OT has a very wide range of usage in Greek. And so when you look at the text like this, you should be very careful before you're going to make a choice as a translator and say, ah, this is a direct quotation marker. Yeah, look at the flow of this thing, make sure that's, that's exactly what's going on. And when you look at it, it does not indicate necessarily that it's a direct quotation. That is one possibility. But when you look at it and you realize that this quote doesn't exist anywhere in, that, in the prophets, and every other quotation has been an exact quotation from the prophet, a prophet before, then it should remind the translator, maybe I should think of different options for this particle. Here's another way to translate this. Perfectly legitimate, be a very easy and common way to do this. I wish in the English translations they would do this. Verse 23. And he went and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that what was spoken of by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Okay, so what I'm doing there is inserting a, the relativizer that to move into uh, an indirect quote or to move the quotation marks down farther. So now what we're looking, another way to read this then, is that what Matthew's quote is, the, the part he's expecting us to look for in the prophets, is the last word there. And that is the, not the phrase he would be called a Nazarene, but we should be looking in the prophets where the prophets refer to the Messiah as a, quote, Nazarene. Okay? Now that simplified things a bit. Now we need to go back and look in the prophets and find where Nazarene appears. But before we do that, we have to ask the question, what does he mean by Nazarene? Right? We're not going to go back in our English Bibles and look in English and say, we're already dealing with some linguistic stuff here. So, Nazarene. What does the word Nazarene mean to you when you hear Nazarene? What does it sound like? If I said, Jesus was a Nazarene. Any ideas from the Old Testament? Yeah, Good. A Nazarite. That's the first thing that usually comes to someone's mind when they hear this. Nazarite. Nazarene. Nazarite. Now, what do you know about a Nazarite? Let's go back and look at the Nazarites in the Old Testament, okay? So let's go back to Numbers chapter 6. So hold your hand there in Matthew and flip back to Numbers. This is Numbers chapter 6. Numbers is, in your Bible, your fourth book of your Old Testament. So you're looking back into your Pentateuch and your Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then Numbers. Numbers chapter 6. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, When either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to Nazarite himself, to Nazar himself, to the Lord. The word Nazarite, in fact, in the text here, it's a, the same root. And separate is the same word. Separate is just the verbal form of the noun here. Nazar, to separate by cutting. You take something, you cut it, and then you move it away. You separate it. Imagine cutting, like, say, a, a piece off of a loaf of bread and pushing it away. And that's the basic idea of the verb here. To cut apart, cut away. And notice the language here. It says, when a man or a woman takes a vow to be a Nazarite, or as to cut him or herself away, to separate himself, look at this language, to the Lord. 
That is a that's the normal way you'd use that verb to to cut away to. And the, the, what's being indicated here is that the individual who's going to cut themselves away from the society for a bit. This is a temporary vow where a man or a woman is going to separate out of the camp. They're going to stay away from the camp, away from the society, away from the family for a bit. A little temporary retreat to the Lord. To the Lord. You see this? To the Lord. So this individual is going to separate themselves from the, from the camp. Temporary period of, of retreat from, the, from the, the normal day. To be with the Lord. To be to the Lord. Okay? Now, it says... He shall separate himself. You keep getting that verb, Nazar. He shall separate himself from wine, strong drink. So wine is, of course, you know what wine is. From the, it's the alcoholic beverage from the, from the vine. Strong drink, that means any other kind of alcoholic beverage. They had date wine. They would make honey wine. They would take, they'd take honey and ferment it. They would take dates and ferment it. These would be their other options you know, at the time. So, no wine, no strong drink. Why? Well, he's a Baptist. I'm just kidding. Okay, so why? Because, it, look, Baptists don't avoid vinegar, do they? No. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink. And you shall not drink any juice of the grapes. Not even grape juice. Or even a grape or a raisin. You can't even eat an incy wincy little raisin. Why? Didn't God make this and it was very good? Yeah. But we don't fast from things because they're bad. We fast from things because they're good. Right? We fast traditionally, like in the nativity fast right now or any times of fasting. We fast from things that are good, good gifts from God. We fast from, we abstain from things for a while to focus on the Lord, to increase our, our spiritual willpower, right? to resist sin and things like that. We've talked about this at other times. But this is a temporary time in which this individual is going to stay away from the fruit of the vine. Even a little raisin. Why is that? Well, if you look at the fruit of the vine throughout the prophets, in fact, all over the Bible, the fruit of the vine is an image of joy. Look at Proverbs 31, right? Proverbs 31. O king, it is not for kings to drink wine and strong drink. That is not, you know, be drunk and chasing after women. This is the first half of Proverbs 31. This is what kings of the world do. They live all their life chasing women and, and alcohol, right? He says, no, no, no. You've got to be sober and right mind to rule justly and to take care of the poor. Give the, give the wine and strong drink, the author there of Proverbs 31 says, to the sorrowing and the poor. <laughs> give it to the, the one who, uh, who, is, who is in misery and let them forget their misery, right? And so in the Bible, you'll find that Wine, although obviously too much wine can cause other problems, but a little wine is the image of, uh, it brings joy to the heart. Proverbs 31. And look, at the, look at Isaiah. The image of the coming of the Messiah and the restoration of all things is described as the mountains running not with springs of water, but springs and rivers of wine. Beautiful, right? This image of just utter joy. Right, a big, a big wedding feast like at Cana, but even but the wine doesn't run out, right? So, so this is a time of of abstinence from the the common things of life, the the all, the, the typical joys of life, of having a glass of wine and eating a bunch of grapes and and living with your family. This individual is going to set himself outside of the camp. Be away from these things, these common, normal, day-to-day activities, as good as they are, to be with the Lord temporarily. Right? All right, so then, it says in chapter 6, verse 5, All the days of his vow of separation of being a Nazarite, 
No razor shall come upon his head until the time is completed for which he se- for which he separates himself. We keep getting this verb every time, the same verb, uh, to the Lord. He shall be holy, that is, set apart. This is another word in Hebrew. Kadosh means to be set apart, distinct. He shall be holy. He shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow long. So if you read what's going on here, and in fact you continue on, it says also he cannot touch anything unclean. The whole time. Why? Because he is now solely devoted to the Lord in a special way for this time. And if the Lord is 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 clean, right? If the Lord is is holy and uh, and not profane, not unclean, then if this individual is separating himself outside of the society to be with the Lord in a special way in a relationship, he's got to keep himself in this same way, holy, set apart, and clean. See how this works? Okay. So it makes pretty, I think it's pretty obvious there, the, the idea. And then the cutting of the hair uh, is then over at the very end of the vow. When his vow is over, after oh, you know, a couple months or a year, a couple years, however long his vow or her vow uh, was, then they would shave their head again. Now, why would they do this? Because the hair is an easy outward sign to the society that this individual is doing something different than before. Think of how easy it is when you see somebody that you know, they got a haircut. They may have just got a little trim. And you say, hey, you got a haircut, didn't you? You're looking good. Oh, it was just a little trim. Imagine if you saw someone in the Old Testament context. Men wore their hair to shoulder length. Their beard, their hair, everything just grew and they just cut it all around shoulder length. It's a big mop. Okay? And then the women would let their hair grow all the way past their shoulders down their back. If a man grew his hair beyond his shoulders, considered effeminate in normal situation. If um, a woman let her hair cut me short, shorter than her shoulders, right? Then it was considered, you know, proper as well. Uh, this is why, if you remember in the in First Corinthians, you got a problem there, right? These Corinthians, these Greeks, have none of this information. They don't know these Jewish traditions, and Paul's pulling his hair out over this because in Corinth. The men have their hair long because remember, Corinth was known for its schools of philosophy and to be, if you were considered an educated student of philosophy in Greece, a sign that you were educated was your hair was long, which for the Jews would mean you were a homosexual, right? And then the a woman in the Jewish society would not wear a veil if she was available. Once she was um, married, Whenever she went outside in public, she always had a veil on her head as a sign that she was no longer available. So, but in Corinth, the women all there, because the Greeks didn't have this custom, they don't have veils on their heads. Which would mean if you were over 20, a female without a veil on your head would mean you're available. Either you're a prostitute or something else. You know? Of course, you can think, imagine the chaos, right? You've got these men with long hair and these women without their heads covered. So St. Paul says, look, we've got to work this thing out. All right, so then, the Nazarite, they can't touch anything unclean, especially a dead body, it says. And they can't drink wine or even eat a raisin. Now, does this match up with what you know about Jesus in the New Testament? Did Jesus ever touch anything unclean? Darren, you think of anything Jesus might have taught, touched unclean? The what's that? When they eat and then the, the sick. Yeah. I mean, Jesus was touching unclean things everywhere, right? He would go out of his way to touch unclean. The leper would come up to him, right? And say, Rabbi, if you will, you can make me clean, right? And Jesus reaches his hand out and touches the leper. And the leper becomes clean, right? Jesus goes out of his way in many instances to do things that would that, that are obviously would be making himself richly unclean. And as he says, 
It's not what goes into the body that makes one unclean. It's what comes out of the mouth, right? Because what comes out of the mouth comes out of the heart. He comments, and we'll talk about this in another study. But we also know, so we know Jesus touched unclean. Does he touch any, have you ever heard of him touching anyone thinking was dead? Yeah, well, we know he, he touches, the when he goes to the upper room, where the synagogue ruler's daughter, you know, Yeros, his, his daughter's sick, and then dies on, while Jesus is on the way. Jesus reaches out and grabs the dead girl's hand and lifts her up. On the way there, a woman with a hemorrhage flowing with blood touched him. When the, in the city of Nain, uh, recorded in Luke's gospel, Jesus sees a, a widow's a widow. She has no husband left, and now her only boy is dead. She see, he sees the burial procession. He walks up. He, gra- he touches the, the. He stops him. He touches the body. He says, "Get up." The boy gets up. So Jesus touches unclean. Jesus touches the dead. The ultimate unclean. What about wine? Jesus. What about wine? Cana. Yeah, Cana. Yeah. What about the wedding at Cana? They ran out of wine, and he made more. Think of the Last Supper. Think of the Last Supper in the Synoptic Gospels. Right? Or, what about uh, you know, this comment here in Matthew's Gospel? This is Jesus' own words. He says, chapter 11, verse 16. This is Matthew chapter 11, verse 16. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates. We piped to you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. Right? They're playing games. They're not playing right. Verse 18, Jesus, For John came neither eating nor drinking. Now, we know John ate and drank, right? but what does he mean? Jesus, or John the Baptist, lived out in the wilderness, right? If he drank anything, it was water. And we know from the angel Gabriel's words, he will drink no wine or no strong drink. So if there's anyone that was a Nazarite, it was John the Baptist, right, in the New Testament. Um, but he, came, he, was neither, he was not drinking, meaning he did not drink, obviously, wine. And he did not eat. Well, we know he ate. We know he ate the grasshoppers and the honey and stuff like that, right? Uh, or whatever that was. But he didn't uh, feast. He wasn't a part of society. He was out on the outskirts, away from society. Again, you can see kind of a Nazarite image there. But, but uh, he says, the Son of Man... Uh, and they said, he, and he has a demon, but the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they said, Behold, a glutton and a drunkard. And this, this, is, this generation cannot be made happy, he says. Right? So we know that Jesus, if you read the stories, he lived in the towns, not in the wilderness. He lived in the, in the towns with the society. He touched the unclean, and he sat, sat down at meals, and he drank. He drank a glass of wine here or there, and they called him a, a, a drunkard. Well, he was no drunkard, though, obviously. Just as he was not a glutton. Right? So they're, 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 you know, just as they're accusing John the Baptist of a demon, they're accusing Jesus also uh, wrongly. So we know of Jesus that uh, he doesn't fit, from the picture of Jesus we have in the New Testament, he doesn't fit too much into this Nazarite image in Numbers chapter 6. Well, then you might say, well, maybe this is not what Matthew meant. And I would agree. Because there's another indication that this is not what Matthew intended for us to think of. And that is that in the Greek text, in the Greek text of Matthew, the Greek word here, Nazarene, translated English, Nazarene, in the Greek this word Nazarios, Nazarios, is a different word than what you get back in number six. And in fact, if you look at the other examples of the use of the word Nazarite in the Old Testament, when you're looking in the Greek text in the Septuagint, you have a different word here. You have 
Nazir, Nazir, which is just a Greek transliteration of the Hebrew word, Nazar. Okay? So, you have a number of indications when you're looking at Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, that Matthew was not thinking of the idea of the Nazarite that we typically think of in our heads when we hear that word Nazarene. Jesus doesn't fit into the image. We know Jesus keeps the law perfectly. He is the law. So how is that? It wouldn't make any sense, right? So he can't be a Nazarite based upon the image we see. But even linguistically, when we look at the text, Nazaraios in the Greek of Matthew is different from Nazir in the Greek text of the Old Testament in the Septuagint. It's not matching up. So there's another indication, right? So then we have to ask the question, well, what in the world is Matthew expecting us to think of? Right? The hint that, and the clue that will tip us off here is that Z. Do you see that Z there in Nazarean? And the Z in Nazareth? Well, that's English. But guess what? In the Hebrew spelling of the word Nazareth, it's not spelled with a Z. It's spelled instead with a Hebrew letter called Tzade. Tzade. It's a T-S sound in English, if you put it into English, the TS, like the TS in pizza, right? The double Z in Italian, pizza, or like my name, carazzo. It's a TS. It's called a tzade. We don't have it in English as an, in a distinct letter, though we've inherited it through, say, Italian and other languages, this kind of this, this combination of the TS sound, double Z in Italian, things like that. But... The, in, if you go back in the Hebrew alphabet, they actually have a character, an actual character, the tzade, tzade. It's a character that, when they put that character there, that little consonant, that is the T-S sound together, the T-S. Okay? It's Nazareth, Nazareth, not Nazareth, Nazareth. And once you have that clue, then you know the word is not Nazaraios that Matthew's hoping you're going to think of, but Nazaraios. Nazaraios. And now we're off to the races. Because Nazar, Nazar, that root, that N, Sade, Resh, that R, means a shoot or a branch. And now what that means is you've got to go back into the prophets and find references to to the Messiah being like a branch. And there's a lot of that. It's in the prophets, plural. Let's look at the most important one for uh, Matthew. Matthew uh, is surely hoping one of the most important ones we're going to think of would be Isaiah chapter 11. No surprise. Matthew's quoting from Isaiah all over the place here, right? He's going to do it again in in another chapter or two. Isaiah chapter 11. There shall come forth. This is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Now, what's the stump of Jesse? Well, you know where the Jesse tree is, right? So, Jesse's tree, the the line of Jesse, that is the line of David, has been cut off. But what happens when you cut a tree down? I remember uh, when I was living in Nebraska, we had a, I think, what was it? It was a... An elm, I think. I think it was an elm tree in the backyard. Anyway, it was growing in the wrong spot. And it was a mess where it was. So we, I had a friend come over at a huge chainsaw. He cut this thing down. Knocked it down. We chopped it up, turned it into firewood. And within a few weeks, a little green sprout shot out of the, out of the side of the trunk, right out of the dirt there. Now, I know about plants and things, so I knew what it was. It was the roots coming out, right? 
But I couldn't believe how fast this thing grew in a tree. Boom! Within a few weeks, this was this big, you know, five, six foot green bush. It was huge. Because it has all of the roots of that tree supplying all of its nutrients, right? So it can grow like, like mad. The, uh, I just had some eucalyptus trees cut down uh, a few months ago at our house, some big monsters. Well, unfortunately, they got cut down, didn't poison them like I asked them to. So there are huge eucalyptus bushes that are now about seven foot tall growing out of these stumps and out of the ground. So everyone, or many people are familiar with this kind of thing. They've seen this before. But this is the image here. The tree has been cut off. The tree, the line of David, the, stump, the tree of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David. But a branch shall grow out of its roots. Okay? Now, just a side note, you might be thinking of, you mean like a sucker? Right, I don't know if you know about trees and things. Sometimes people refer to the things coming out of the roots a sucker. That's just with fruit trees when you have a graft because that's a, a different rootstock than the tree. But that's for another topic. This is where we're talking about a tree like, say, an olive tree or, a, um, or a, you know, a, any kind of a tree or a, an oak tree or something. You whack it to the ground and you'll find the roots shoot out. Okay? A, a non-grafted tree is what we're talking about here. A branch shall grow out of its roots. Now look at that word branch there. You see the word branch? A branch shall grow out of its roots. The word branch there, the word branch in Hebrew is netzer. Netzer. En tzare reish. Netzer. But guess what? This isn't the only place that this idea appears. If you go back into Jeremiah, and I'll just give you a couple of these references. You can write these down for those of you who are taking notes. You can uh, write down Jeremiah 23, 5. Also, Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16. Also, Zechariah chapter 3. Verse 8. Also, Zechariah chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. Okay? Now, these references, let's go take a look at one or two of them just so you can get a sense of it. Let's go over to the first one I gave you, Jeremiah 23. Chapter 23, verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. Think that would, might be an important prophecy for someone in the first century? And he shall reign as king and deal wisely. Well, what do we know about Jesus' identity in Matthew chapters 1 and 2? He's the king, right? Where is he who was born king of the Jews? He's the Christ, the anointed king. Think that might be important? Yeah. Now the Hebrew word here, guess what, is not Netzer. It's Tzamak. Tzamak. This is Tzade again. T-S. And an M. And then a C-H, like Bach. Basically, if you want to spell it in English. Tzamach. Okay? Tzamach. This word in Hebrew means branch, sprout. It means the exact same thing. Let's look at another example. Uh, we, uh, Jeremiah, I think we just do this quickly. Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah 33, verse 14. Jeremiah 33, verse 14. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days of the time I will cause a righteous branch, Tzamach, to spring forth for David. 
He shall execute justice, righteousness in the land. In those days Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it shall be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Okay? And then Zechariah. Zechariah is one of your minor prophets, but he's an easy one to find because he's one of the longest. One of the longest. Zechariah. Zechariah. Chapter 3. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8. Verse, uh, verse 8 there. Hear now, O Joshua, high priest. Remember, Joshua and Jesus is the same name. You and your friends who are sit before you, for they are men of good omen. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. The branch. Again, this is tzamach in Hebrew. And you can read on. There's more neat stuff in there. And then also, again, as long as we're in Zechariah, we might as well do the final one. Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah chapter 6, verse... Uh, look at verse 12 there. And the Lord says to him, Thus says the Lord, this is chapter 6, verse 12, Behold, the man whose name is Branch, Tzamach, for he shall grow up in this place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. I think that's important for Matthew's Gospel, right? Matthew 16. Okay. So you can see why Matthew then does what he does. You can turn back to Matthew's Gospel now. Why does Matthew do what he does there? Because he is he says it this way because there are multiple prophets. Isaiah, once at least. Jeremiah, twice. Zechariah, twice. And they're using slightly different words in Hebrew. So Matthew's not going to give you some exact quote. He's just telling you the word branch. But he does use Nazar because guess what? As far as we can discern in the first century, Nazareth, the town of Nazareth, branch town, was a Davidic village. A Davidic village of returnees from the Babylon exile. When they came back, they set up a little uh, a village there. It wasn't very large. The first century, time of Jesus, I don't know, it was supposed to be like 200 people or something. It's not very big. Okay, now... How do we know that that's what Matthew was talking about? I mean, it's pretty, it seems like it's pretty obvious. It's like this concept of the branch, the branch. This is a, a pretty important theme in the prophets. The Messiah is going to be a branch. He's like, he's a branch for David. He comes from the stump of Jesse. What else might help us? Well, remember that when the New Testament authors are quoting from the, New Test, or the Old Testament, they're assuming something they cannot assume of an audience today. And that is that their audience knows the Old Testament like the back of their hand. We know that because of a certain pattern that you see in the quotations from the Old Testament. When a New Testament author quotes from the Old Testament, they're hoping you're going to, of course, think of the Old Testament verse they're quoting. But usually the punchline or something significant is the very next line that they did not quote. How would they know that you would know that? Because they and their audience didn't have MTV. They had the Old Testament memorized. They knew the book of Isaiah. You could quote a line from the prophets or the Psalms and they could just start reciting for you. So, Let's go back to Isaiah. Hold your hand there, Matthew. And flip back to Isaiah and see what, what, is, what might be another clue beyond, beyond Nazar and Nazareth and Nazarios that this is what he's talking about, this, this branch, which obviously I think is already pretty obvious. Go back to Isaiah chapter 11 and look what it says. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot... From the stump of Jesse. And a branch, Nazar, shall come out of his roots. 
and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. As soon as he tells you he's the branch, which means that he is the anointed, he's the Christ of the line of David, he tells you the Spirit is going to rest upon him. And you know, of course, that he is the, this is the anointed one, right? Because he's got the Spirit, right? Remember the Spirit, the Christos, the Hamashiach, the Messiah, was the anointed one uh, who has the Spirit, right? From the Old Testament. Now flip back to Matthew's Gospel. Look what it says there in Matthew chapter 2. He shall be called a branch. And look at chapter 3. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The very next story is about the anointing of Jesus and the descent of the Spirit. You say, wow, this is, this is pretty neat stuff. Guess what? We never have to reinvent the wheel. Because the fathers of the church told us this a long time ago. St. Jerome, one of the more important commentators on the biblical text among the early church uh, fathers, points back to this, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, as the solution to the conundrum that has often bothered people. What is he talking about? What passage? He shows you what's obvious. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. And you can even see the context with the flow of the Spirit and all that. 